It is truly wonderful to see everyone this morning. It's even good to have, well, what's his name, uh, Bailey back with us. That's <laughs> what happens when you're gone so long. People forget who you are. It is wonderful to be here, to be able to gather together to worship our God. This morning we're going to be talking about the Bible and how it's sufficient for all faith. And what actually prompted this lesson is what Gary gave as a lesson on Wednesday night. He talked, he gave a very good lesson on faith and how it is to be an active faith. And we are not saved by faith alone. This is a subject that is foundational to our salvation. And it's something that's important. And the only reason I'm giving this is because so many people have always come up to me when I've given a Sunday evening sermon. And they said, that needed to be preached on Sunday morning. Well, that's the same thing true with this subject here. I think the Sunday morning crowd needs to hear something about faith, the, fu the fundamental of our salvation. And I'm not trying to trump Gary's uh, lesson because I don't think he, I could. He gave a really good lesson. I wish that all of y'all could have been here to, to hear that lesson. But this evening, we're going to approach this lesson in a different way. We could do it in the common way and and say that everything in the formation of faith is to be excluded except for God's Word. You know, what men say is certainly to be excluded. Matthew 21, verse 25, Jesus implied this as he talked about John's baptism. Was it from heaven or of men? The implication was, it's from heaven. Also, Jesus said in Matthew 13, 15, all tradition is going to be rooted up. Also, men cannot rely upon themselves, Jeremiah 10, 23. It's not in man that walks to direct his own steps. Human wisdom will fail us, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 through 25. The conscience, it can be defiled, Titus 1, verse 15. Thus, it's not reliable. Philosophy leads astray, Colossians 2, 8. Visions are deceitful, Colossians 2, 18. And the multitude is not going to be a dependable guide. Jesus made that very plain in Matthew 7, 13, that the majority of this world are traveling in the wrong direction. And we cannot trust religious experience. As Jesus said in Matthew 24, 24, wonders will deceive even the elect. And we certainly cannot trust the feelings of our hearts, Jeremiah 17, verse 9. But on the contrary, the word of God is able to make man complete, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 through 17. It's understandable, 2 Corinthians 1.13. It will convict, Hebrews 4.12. It will convert, as was read in our scripture reading in Psalm 19, verse 7. God's word justifies, Romans 3.28. It will save us, Romans 1.16. It sanctifies us, John 17.17. 17. It edifies us, Acts 20, verse 32. God's word begets us, 1 Peter 1, 23, and gives birth, James 1, 18. God's word gives life, Matthew 4, 4. It guides us, Psalm 73, 24. Frees us from sin, John 8, verse 32. That truth sets us free. It gives us understanding, Psalm 119, verse 104. Enlightens us, verse 130. Gives us comfort, Romans 15, verse 4, helps us to grow, 1 Peter 2, verse 2. As newborn babes, we are to desire the sincere milk of the word. It works in us, 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. Keeps us from sin, Psalm 119, verse 11, and gives light, verse 130. It keeps us from erring, Matthew 22, 29. And it accomplishes God's will, Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. You know, this could make a sufficient lesson in itself. But as I said, I want to take a different route with our lesson this morning. What I want to do is I want to study the human heart. And how is that heart influenced? And show that a direct operation of the Spirit upon the human heart is contrary to what God's Word actually teaches. Let's notice a few passages that reveal the nature of the human heart. And to understand the nature of the human heart will help us to understand how it is opened and how faith comes. Now, first of all, we have to recognize that the Bible heart 
is the seat of one's thoughts. In Matthew 9, verse 4, we read, And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? Right off the bat, we learn that the human heart thinks very much similar to what Solomon said in Proverbs 23, verse 7. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And this is very similar also to Isaiah 32, verse 4. It says, the heart shall understand knowledge. Then in Proverbs 14, 10, we're told that the heart knows. The human heart can also doubt, as Jesus told his apostles in Mark 11, verse 23. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou taken up and cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. Paul told the Corinthians that they were to give as they have purposed in their hearts, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. And Solomon says in Proverbs 16, 9, that man's heart deviseth his way, so it plans and it devises. On the same thought, our heart is able to reason, Mark chapter 2, verse 5. It is definitely the seat of one's thoughts, his intellect. This here is the Bible heart, not here. But secondly, we know something else about the heart. It's also the seat of feelings as well as thoughts. It desires. Remember Paul's desire in his heart that all Israel might be saved, Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Not only that, it's capable of repentance. Paul, speaking to hypocrites, said or spoke of their hardness and impenitent heart, Romans chapter 2, verse 4. So the heart of those who were doomed for destruction were capable of repenting in their heart, but of course they chose not to. Esther chapter 7, verse 5 teaches that the heart can presume. And certainly with all of our heart, we are to love the Lord our God, Matthew 22, 37. On the flip side of that, you can actually despise someone in your heart. That's exactly what Michael, King's, uh, King Saul's daughter, did, who is the wife of David. She despised David in his heart whenever he was out there dancing and frolicking around in 2 Samuel 6, 16. The heart is that part of man which is able to receive the law of God. Because God is quoted in Hebrews 8, verse 10, and also 10, 16, I will put my laws into their mind and write them upon their hearts. Do you notice how it's worded there? This is what we call Hebrew parallelism. It's comparing the mind and the heart together. They are one and the same. Nehemiah 2, 2 speaks of sorrow that may be felt in the heart. And we're told in Daniel 7, 15 that Daniel was grieved in his heart. And then also Paul tells the Romans, you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, Romans 6, verse 17. So obedience even springs from the heart. So certainly as we look at the scriptures dealing with the human heart, and there's many more than just what we've quoted here, it's easy to see that the heart is the seat of emotions as well as the seat of intellect. It is that rational thinking part of man. And since it is the rational part of man, then what moves it must be something that appeals to the intellect that is able to change it and able to reform it. So what is it that opens the heart? Well, the psalmist tells us in our scripture reading this morning in Psalm 19, verse 7, the, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. To convert means to change or to turn around. What does this to the heart? It's the law of the Lord. So Jeremiah 23, 29 says, Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like as a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? The word of God is designed for nothing else than to change the human heart, our minds, our thinking process. The psalmist again said in Psalm 119, verses 104 and 105, Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. And then he says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word of God is designed to affect our hearts, the way we think, the way we process things. 
It's a light to show the way, a light to give us understanding so that we can know and hate every false way. So after the word has worked in a person, that person then winds up being changed. Again, the psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 9, Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? And he gives the answer, By taking heed thereunto according to thy word. It's only by the application of the word of God that we are able to cleanse our lives the way that we live. Now this word of God, of course, it sets man at attention. The Hebrew writer said this concerning the word in Hebrews 4 verse 12. He says, the word of God is quick. That means it's alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What more has the power to open and to turn the heart of man? It was the preaching of the word, if you remember, that opened Lydia's heart. Acts chapter 16, verse 14. The same thing that calls those on the day of Pentecost to ask Peter and the other apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts chapter 2, verse 37. In Acts chapter 16, we're told that God opened Lydia's heart. Whereas in Acts chapter 2, we notice that it was Peter's preaching. But remember, what God's word accomplishes, God accomplishes. There's no passage in the Bible that I know of that says that God works on the human heart in any other way than through his word. God opened Lydia's heart through the preaching of Paul, just like he pricked the hearts of the Pentecostians through the preaching of Peter. This is the same way that God opens our hearts today, is through the preaching of the gospel. They not only gave heed to what was said, but they wanted to know what else they had to do. They wanted to know what else it took to be saved, and we need to know what else it takes to, be, to remain saved. So it's no wonder Paul could say in Romans 1 verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God in salvation to everyone that believeth. And again in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 through 17, Paul says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine or teaching, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or complete, truly furnished into all good works. I like the way the King James renders that. He says, we are truly furnished. Not thoroughly, but truly furnished. We are furnished through and through to where we will be complete with our whole being. So yes, the Bible heart is the mind. And the scriptures is what opens that mind. So what about this idea that we hear from a lot of people about this direct operation of the Holy Spirit upon the human heart? There's always been a lot of strange thinking regarding on how we are saved and how we are to be strengthened in our faith. And for many years, as well as today, some have taught that we receive this irresistible grace from God through this direct operation of his Holy Spirit upon the human heart. And this is one of the major tenets of John Calvin's tulip doctrine, that I stands for irresistible grace. But you know, when you look at the scriptures, you don't find that. We find that the Bible teaches otherwise. Listen to the words of Jesus in John 5:24. He says, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me is passed from death unto life. Jesus clearly teaches that we don't automatically receive eternal life. There's something that we have to do. He says you have to hear and you have to believe. And Jesus said so. Paul taught that the scriptures are able to make us complete and that they furnish us unto every good work, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. I don't think this passage could be clearer that we don't need a direct operation of the Spirit because we have the Word that is able to make us complete. These are the words of the Spirit. So, the Spirit works on us, but not directly. He works on us through His Word. Jesus said this again in John 6, verses 44 and 45. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, 
and they shall all be, notice this, taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and learned of the Father cometh unto me. The truth of the matter is that God's word is completely sufficient, and the Christian religion is to be taught, it is to be heard, and it is to be learned through the process of words. Now, some think that the Spirit works on us and guides us by some miraculous or non-informational guidance. But the Bible says that He works on us and He guides us, but it's through His Word. Let's note some scriptures concerning this. Listen to what Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. He says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Even for the apostles and the prophets, there was no miraculous operation here, but we notice that the Spirit spoke using words, revealing God's truth and His will through words. Again, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2.13, which things we also speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, implying words, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 3, verses 7 through 8, Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit saith, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day in the, temptation, in the wilderness of temptation. The Holy Spirit spoke, and he taught and he guided by moral persuasion. I'm not aware of any scripture in which he manipulated the mind of someone through force of any kind. But it was all by revelation. David expressed it this way in 2 Samuel verses 23, verses 1 and 2. He said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The Spirit spoke and he spoke through David's mouth. Peter affirmed this in the New Testament in Acts chapter 1, verse 16. He said, the Spirit spake before by the mouth of David. So when the Spirit wished to influence men through words, he spoke through the prophet's mouths. Again, using words. So the Spirit doesn't use direct force. He doesn't use this mysterious coercion. He uses words. They are his tools. They are his vehicles for information. And therefore, Paul could well say, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. Now, we don't deny at all that God works in us. In fact, I want you to listen to what Paul said in Philippians 2, verse 13. He said, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. But the question is, how does he work in us? Does he work in us in some mysterious way? Or should we not even worry about it since we don't know exactly how? Well, actually, the scriptures actually give us the answer for that. The same author, Paul, said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which you have heard of us, you received it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God, and notice this, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So in one scripture, Paul says God works in you, Philippians 2.13. But in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, he says God's word is what works through you. Surely we can understand by this that God works in us or on us through his word. I mean, didn't he put words in the mouths of the prophets in order to teach and to guide mankind? Remember what God's word does, God does. That's how he works, through his word. And in fact, this is actually brought up very clearly by David in Psalm 29, verse 5. Listen to what he said. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. What his voice did, he did. Same thing in verse 8. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. 
So what God's voice does through words, God does. Now there are two types of force. You have mechanical and you have persuasive. Let's say we want somebody to be to remove from this auditorium. Now we could take them and we could remove them physically or we could ask them, persuade them to leave by arguments, warnings, admonitions, uh, promised blessings, or some other type of motive. Now God can convert, he can sanctify, he can strengthen, he can edify a man as he chooses. But does he do this by direct physical force by the Spirit or through moral persuasion by words? I think the psalmist answers that for us in our scripture reading in Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord converteth the soul, or is perfect and converts the soul. And I think Paul even agrees with that in the New Testament in Romans 8, verse 2. Listen to what he says. He says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The law, the words. So the law of God converts, Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of God sanctifies, John 17, 17. The law of God edifies, Acts 20, verse 32. That's why we're told in James 1, verse 22, that God's word saves, or verse 21, I should say. But it saves because it gives warnings. It gives threats. It gives promises. It gives blessings as high as heaven and as deep as hell. We reflect upon these things that are written. And then according to our hearts, we react. We are changed. Or if we don't listen to them, then we may not be changed. But I want you to listen to what Jesus said to the Pharisees in John 8, verse 37. He said, I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. They heard everything that they needed to about Jesus, but they rejected everything that he said. They refused to believe in the Christ or his words. But when you're talking about his disciples, those who were saved, we have a different note. Listen to what he told them in John 15, 3. He says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. So, we are converted not by a direct operation of the Spirit upon our heart, but the Spirit of God uses the truth, His Word, to convert. And through that truth, God works on us. So if it's by heeding the Word by which we are converted and finally saved, then the only thing that stops a person from conversion, sanctification, and conviction is a personal choice not to obey. It's not going to do us any good to wait for this, this uh, mysterious supra-literary influence upon our hearts because it's not going to come. If you're waiting on the Holy Spirit to move you in some mysterious way, you're going to be waiting for eternity because that's not going to happen. That's not the way God designed salvation. So my admonition to you is love the Bible. Learn the Bible. And more importantly, live the Bible. Faith only comes by hearing God's word, Romans 10, 17. And without faith, it's impossible to please him, Hebrews 11, verse 6. So once you come today in faith, let the word of God work on you, change you for the better, to change you to where you can have the hope of eternal life. Now the word of God tells us exactly what we have to do. There's no mystery to what we have to do in order to obtain salvation. God clearly says you have to hear the word to have faith. So we need to know what the word says. The word tells us we must believe that Jesus is the Christ in order to have salvation. Romans chapter 9 uh, verses 8 and 9 or 9 and 10. And then we also have to repent of our sins. Acts 17 verse 30. At one time, God overlooked all the ignorance of man, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. We must confess Jesus Christ before men. Again, Romans uh, 9, verses 10 and 9. And then we have to, of course, be baptized. 
in order to receive the remission of sins, Acts 2.38, in order to receive salvation, Romans 16.16. 16. And then we have to live faithful. How have you lived your life? Are you a Christian? And if you are, are you living the way you should according to the precepts of God, according to his word? If you find yourself lacking in any part, let us help you. Remember, your eternal soul depends upon that. If there's anything that we can help you with, we encourage you to respond to the invitation this morning. While together, we stand and sing.